No, you did good. Well, good morning. So one of the things that happens, and we're going to look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and one of the things that can happen to us if we're not careful is because we've been hurt, we tend to withdraw, we tend to not empathize any longer. We look at them from a distance. We want to maybe silver line it, like she said, which is the idea that, well, at least, you know, whatever. And to really empathize with somebody, we have to open ourselves up to getting hurt. And Paul, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, is dealing with people... Now, here's what's wild. There are people who chased Paul out of town. Realize he came in town beaten and bruised. You have the jailer in Philippi. A lot of us know that story. And then Paul comes into town. He's beaten and bruised. I can't imagine what he looked like. Probably an MMA fighter. Uh, maybe had cauliflower ear by now. And uh, uh, so he comes into town. And then just a few weeks later, they chase him out of town. And then the same people that chased him out of town say, well, he left in a hurry, didn't he? Must have been here for selfish reasons. I mean, just amazing. Now, I don't know if you've ever had anybody question your integrity, but it's a really painful thing, especially when you feel like you're good in an area. So we're going to talk about that today, and, and I, hope, I hope today, if you've been one of those people that's been hurt by people, um, I hope that you'll realize, number one, you're not alone, and number two is that God still wants to use you You'll just have to find who the right people are. Now, I'm going to talk about this string in just a minute, but I remember when I taught junior high, one of my favorite magic tricks had nothing to do with string, by the way. Uh, I would take a, a, a piece of paper. I learned this from somebody. Take a piece of paper, and I would bring a student up front, and I'd have them stand right in front of me, and um, I'd hold the piece of paper, right? And I'd say, I'm going to make it disappear. Now, I'm a lousy mu a magician because I'm way too ADD. I just, I ruin tricks. I would like, okay. But anyway, so, but this was one of my favorites. And if you want to try this on grandkids, this one works really well on grandkids. You bring them really close to you and you say, watch the paper and you put it hand to hand to hand to hand to hand and you do this back and forth. And at one point you throw it over their shoulder, right over their shoulder. They have no idea. And then you go like this and they and I would do this with, with uh, junior high kids, and as long as the other students didn't say anything, I'd have five and six balls of paper right behind the student, which was awesome. It just got funnier and funnier as I did it. I know, we don't embarrass kids anymore. It's just no fun anymore. It was fun back then. The reason I say that is this. Uh, Houdini, uh, the last about 20 years of his life, uh, made it one of his goals to disprove all of these fake seances that were going on. It, it, it became such a problem that he actually went to Congress and, and made a presentation to Congress to try to get them to pass a law. Because here's what he knew. He knew as a magician what was really going on. So he would visit these things. They even offered money uh, uh, at a few of these things for him to disprove them. And of course, you know, he did over and over again. And he would look and say, there's a string. There's a, they're moving this this way. They're, they're shaking that tambourine in the dark and with the string. And, and so he knew what strings to look for, where the fakes were, where the problems were, because he had dealt with it. And here's the deal. Paul, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, is dealing with people saying, you're a trickster, because in Thessalonica, they had a bunch of people who were always selling religion. They had every kind of religion in Thessalonica, even Egyptians' religion. It was like that scene in Airplane where they're trying to walk through the airport and all the different religions are coming up to you with a rose and you finally just have to start beating up people to get out of there. That was Thessalonica. And if you knew what I was talking about, you saw a movie you probably shouldn't have seen as a child. Anyway, so, so the truth is Thessalonica was that way. And they began to accuse Paul, hey, Paul, you've got strings. They're, this is fake. You're pretending. You're faking. You ran out of town because you're just a, you're like all these other guys. You're just in it for the money. You're just in it for this. And Paul began in chapter 2 to kind of answer what was going on. But he didn't just stop there. He not only answered his critics, he demonstrates how in God's word we have to pay attention so that we continue to open our hearts to others. 
that we pay attention to. Is there a person that's in our lives that has a string attached to them so that we don't accidentally open our hearts to the wrong people? And so today I want to look at this and talk about how can we demonstrate God's word in us. And some of you have quit being vulnerable. Why? Because you've been hurt. And today I'm going to give you insights. We're going to talk about being vulnerable, genuine and vulnerable, generous and caring, and grateful and hopeful. And I hope that you'll also understand how you can always go to God's word and say, what does the Bible say about that? So that you can check, is, is what this person's saying a trick? Is, is, this a, is this weird? Is this something that doesn't line up with God's word? Is it the enemy trying to... By the way, Satan's first trick was to tell Adam and Eve, hey, God didn't say that. And what was he doing? He was using a trick. What did God really mean by that, right? And he was trying to pull them away from God. And that's what the enemy is always trying to do. He doesn't want you to be able to use your gifts. So let's talk about this. Number one, if you want people to see God's word in you, be genuine and vulnerable. Now, don't, don't mix this up with being foolish. You, your whole life, have to pay attention to whether or not somebody deserves for you to be vulnerable with them. You have to have good boundaries. And so when you're dealing with different people, you have to pay attention to what they're saying and doing. We have some wonderful people here. And I'll never forget, one of them called me on Thanksgiving Day and said, hey, this, this homeless guy's here. It's Thanksgiving Day. He's got a sign that says we'll work for food. And I think we ought to help him. And I said, no problem. Tell him we've got some work for him to do, and you just bring him down to the church. Now, this is Thanksgiving. I wasn't planning on coming to the church, but I thought, well, if I got to, I got to. And he, surprisingly, the guy called me back, and guess what he said? Can anybody guess what he said to me? He didn't want to work. He just wanted a handout. So you've got to look for these things in life. What are the strings? Is this a safe person? Is this a person I can be vulnerable with, or do I need to be cautious with this person. Listen to what Paul says. He says, you know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. Basically, it wasn't empty. We had previously suffered, and I love this, been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of God, we dared to tell you his gospel. Remember, gospel means good news. In the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives. What's he being accused of? He's being accused of not teaching the truth, and he's being accused of impure motives. By the way, many times that's the first thing somebody will accuse you of. And so Paul continues from that. He says, now, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please people, but God, and I love this, who tests our hearts. Let me, let me tell you the good news and the bad news about life. Here's the good news. The good news, like when you make a mistake or you say something you didn't mean to say, you offended somebody you didn't mean to offend. So the good news is God knows your heart. Amen. But let me tell you the bad news. You ready for the bad news? God knows your heart. So that means that time that you smiled at somebody and you said just the right thing to them and inside you were thinking, <laughs> doofus. That time that you told your pastor, oh, I'd love to help you move. Just be honest. Go, I don't want to help you, but I'm going to. Every once in a while I'll say to somebody, no, 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 I really, I want to help you move. Okay, I don't want to, but I'm going to help you move. God knows your heart. He looks at our motives. He said, we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, nor you or anyone else. As apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. And I love that. Paul's like, if I wanted to, I could have just said, I saw Jesus do what I tell you. But he said, we didn't. Instead, we were like young children among you. 
by the way, this is also a caution to be careful when somebody says, God told me to tell you, <laughs> because usually what they're trying to do is manipulate you. So just be really careful. I'm not saying that God can't do that, but be very careful when somebody says, God told me to tell you. And Harold Brantley taught me years ago what to say when somebody does that, because he said people would come up to him, he'd be sitting in the front row getting ready to speak, and somebody come up and go, Pastor, God told me to say something. And Harold would look at them and go, but he didn't tell me yet, so as soon as he tells me, I'll let you up there. And then he'd get up on the thing. Loved Harold, it was awesome. Paul here is being honest about his suffering, even though he's being accused falsely. And one of the things I've said as a pastor for many years is, listen, if you think something or something bothers you, send me a note. I'm not, listen, I'm hard to find at the office. That's nothing new. When this church started, I said, if you want a pastor that sits in the office, don't hire me. Get somebody else. Do something different. But if you want a pastor who you can get a hold of and get in touch with, who will reach out to you, then, then that's okay. But if you want one that sits in the office and looks at the wall and wonders uh, and does his taxes or his Checkbook, I had a staff member that used to do their checkbook every day, every day, for an hour, every day. You all work at the Space Center. We're not even going to start, right? I didn't even know there was newspapers until I talked to people from the Space Center. I'm like, you guys still read that? Every day. Anyway, sorry, did I say all that out loud? I meant for some of that to stay inside. Am I lying? Just let me ask you. He don't know. Yeah, yeah, I got that. Don't ask, don't tell. Okay, I gotcha. So I said, you can ask me anything. Well, over the, can I tell you two crazy things that happened over the years? I had one person who thought I was stealing from the church because the church was paying my cell phone bill. They finally came to me after a year of telling other people that I was stealing and said, hey, I know you've been stealing from the church. I saw the books and I said, did you talk to our finance person? They said, no, but I know it because I saw the bill. I said, well, did you know that the church also gets a check from me every month? And the only reason why the church was paying my bill is because the church at that time could not get their own account. And I, out of the generosity of my heart, <laughs> and would pay the church back for my part. Another person thought that the church paid for me to adopt my daughter. I have no idea why they even, I'm like, well, I have no idea why you even thought that. But all they would have had to do, you ready? Ask me. I'll tell you. I had a guy one time come to me. He goes, I don't think you should have a church cell phone. And my answer was very easy. I said, take it, please. Take it. <laughs> By the way, he never asked me again about it. Because I told him, if you take it, you have to answer the phone. Just ask. And that's what Paul's saying. He's like, listen. If I had impure motives, I wouldn't be talking about this stuff. Now, Paul wasn't trying to push people away. Anybody who says, don't ask questions is a problem. Anybody who says, don't look behind the curtain, like Wizard of Oz, is a problem, right? It should be okay to ask questions. Listen to what 2 Corinthians 6.3 says. Paul says this, we put no stumbling block in anyone's past. Why? So our ministry will not be discredited. What was the enemy trying to do? Well, Paul was spreading God's word, the gospel, the good news about Jesus. And because it was beginning to spread, the enemies of Paul and the enemies of the church said, wait a second, he's messing up our business. Let's accuse him of what we actually do. And that's one of the things you'll find in life is that people will accuse you of what they're guilty of. Has that happened to you yet? If not, you're not old enough yet. You need to grow up. Right? Because the truth is, people often accuse us of the very things that they do. And sometimes it's so funny, it's like, really? You're saying that? Interesting, right? C.S. Lewis said this, To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe. It will not be broken. It will be unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. And some of you have been hurt and you have so gone to protecting your heart 
that you don't ever go out of your way for anybody because you don't want to be hurt. When you love people, you open yourself up to being vulnerable. When you open yourself up to being vulnerable, you open yourself up to being hurt. People will accuse you falsely. People will accuse you of things they're guilty of. But guess what? You're not doing it for people. Number two, be generous and caring. One of our members came up to me right before church last night and said, I've been out of my house now for four months. We had a flood and the insurance doesn't want to pay. It's a mess. That's such a shocker to me. And she said, somebody from the church came and said, four months is too long to not have a home-cooked meal. Would you please come over this week and let us cook a meal for you? Now, do you may, that may not seem like a big deal. Like, what's the big deal? You know, you make, I don't know if it was pasta, but, you know, you make some food and give it to somebody. I mean, how, that's, you had them over to the house now. You had to clean. That's big. That's big. For some of you, I get it, right? You're like, pastor, don't come over. I'll meet you at a restaurant. It's fine, right? I get it. But the truth is, we think sometimes it's this huge act that we need to do. Caring and being generous is about paying attention to other people. It's about looking outside of yourself and saying, God, is there anybody that I need to bless and look for and, and go out of my way to empathize with, to care about? Listen, just as a nursing mother, Paul said, cares for her children, so we cared for you. There's a baby in the back, so cute. Ronnie, you're doing such a good job. She's still sleeping. I'm just going to stop the service for a minute. We're going to, all right. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted, listen to this, to share with you not only the gospel of our God, but our lives as well. I love this. Surely you remember. And after we say that, we say, don't call me Shirley. You all knew that. Brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship, we work day and night in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel to you. Basically, he was being accused of being selfish and self-centered. By the way, if you haven't been accused of being selfish and self-centered lately, you haven't helped anybody. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children. Encouraging, comforting, and listen to the last one carefully. Urging you to live lives worthy of God. Basically, we got to step up, right? That last one. Who calls you into his kingdom and glory. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says this, we have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and open wide our hearts to you. This is what I talk to the kids about. One of the things that you can do is teach your kids good boundaries. What does that mean? That means that you teach them, and some of you didn't have good boundaries because you had parents that you were never allowed to say no to for anything. So you didn't learn good. You thought if to say no was evil. We've got to teach our kids a good yes and a good no. Why? Because there's tricksters in the world. There's hurtful people in the world. There's people who will take advantage of you. There's people who are around you who you need to pay attention. Do they have false motives? Are they looking to trick? Have they tricked other people? Are they looking for things to do? And you pay attention to that. So you open your heart, but open your heart to the right people. So with that in mind, somebody sent me this list this week, and I thought, that's interesting. I think that'll go with my sermon. And here it is. It's five or six, excuse me, six signs that you're in a cult. Thought you'd enjoy this. Here we go. Number one, the leader is always right. I agree with that one. I don't know what's wrong with that. I think that's absolutely... <laughs> By the way, if you can never question a leader, that's not a leader. You're in a cult. If you can't say, I'm not so sure about that one. If you can't say, I agree with 90%, but not 10. If that 10 causes other people to go, how dare you? Then you need to worry that you're in a cult. If they're asking you to drink Kool-Aid. Okay, sorry. Maybe I should do a redneck list. Like Number two, criticism of the leader or questions are called persecution. 
Anytime you question them, anytime you ask, oh, you're persecuting me. Number three, anything the leader does is justified no matter how harmful. Well, they did that. They had a good reason. Really? Number four, the leader is the only source of truth. Everyone else is lying. Don't believe those people. I know there's 400 of them, but don't believe any of them. Number five, followers must be blindly devoted to the leader and never question him or her. That sounds like number one, doesn't it? And then finally, the members will not recognize that they belong to a cult. So that makes it extra difficult. By the way, don't take this list to one of your family members and go, see? Okay, that doesn't work. And I don't know if any of you, I've had family in cult before, so that's fun. Uh, right? This is why it's so important to go back to God's word. This is why it's so important to say to people, listen, don't believe me. Don't believe the pastor. I don't care how great. You, you may listen to the best pastor in the world, but he's still human. So even the per person with the best motives doesn't always get their motives right. Do you? Haven't you ever been disappointed with yourself? Try to go on a diet, see what happens. Are Girl Scout cookies still on sale? <laughs> you might be safe for a week if not. I promise you, if you go on a Girl Scout free cookie diet, the next day Girl Scouts will show up at your house giving away whatever your favorite Girl Scout cookie is for free. That's just how life works. And so even ourselves, we have to say, God, would you forgive me? And go back to God's word and say, what does God's word say about it? What's the truth? What really matters? My favorite one recently is the TV preacher. And if you haven't seen this clip yet, Google it when you get home. I, I couldn't play it in church. It's just too insane. It's a TV preacher telling people that God wants to heal their baldness. That's where he starts. By the way, this guy has like three Learjets now or something crazy because God wanted him to get Learjets because, you know, you need one or two or three. I don't know. But anyway, so he literally had people in church putting their hand on their head and he yells, hair, with a country accent, by the way. And they in the audience all yell, hair. And you can see people in the, and I'm thinking, oh, cult. I mean, who is, I'd be more embarrassed by that than a toupee. Get a toupee, right? It's craziness. So be careful what you believe and what it's based on. Always go back and go, well, how does this compare to God's word? And listen, listen, I would do that with my, when you listen to a sermon here, please go back to God's word and go, well, I missed it there. By the way, sometimes the next week I get up and go, by the way, what I said last week about this, mm, got to mess that one up. Number three. Be grateful and hopeful. You are not going to like this question that I'm going to ask you. Do you think more about the people you care about or the people you're mad at? As you go through your week, I want you to evaluate. Do I think more about the people I'm mad at? By the way, some of the people you're mad at, you don't even know. The news told you to be mad at them. Sports Center told you to be mad at them. That's the new thing. That used to not be true. But in the last 20 years, all of a sudden, Sports Center, I'm supposed to be mad at somebody, some coach who didn't follow the rules or stole somebody's playbook. or I don't, I don't know. I'm like, well, well, what am I supposed to be mad at? I didn't even know about a playbook until Sports Center told me there was one. I'm like, oh. Do you think more about the people you care about and look for ways to care about them or more about the things you're mad at? That will tell you whether or not you're being grateful and hopeful. Listen to what Paul says here. And, and here he is being accused of all kind of things. <laughs> and he's an apostle. He could be like, you know what? You guys are a bunch of idiots. I'm never coming back there. Here's what he says. And we thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as human word, but as it actually is the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. 
Therefore you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same thing those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets who drove us out. Remember I told you what happened to Paul? They displeased God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so they may be saved. In this way, they heap up their sin to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. And then a few verses later, he says, for what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. So Paul spends most of that chapter talking about these accusations and defending himself against false accusations. And then he says, but you know what the biggest deal is? What God's doing in you. I want to encourage you to look at your life and evaluate whether or not you've shut down because you've been hurt. And whether or not your focus is on anger and frustration more than it is on caring and being concerned for people. Are you noticing the people around you that are making a difference? I got a phone call yesterday. And this is what the guy said to me. Do you realize how awesome this member of your church is? I said, yeah, I think they're awesome. No, no, no. You have no idea. And I wanted to say, yeah, I do. I said, really? He said, yeah. This guy mentors people, encourages people. And I said, yeah, I knew. It's awesome. We have some wonderful people at our church. And Ernie, when they called about you the other day, I told him that you didn't have to pay them quite so much as to say, no, I'm just kidding. But it's true. They called just to tell me that. But let me tell you something about helping people. This week I got to talk to, an, or last week I got to talk to an old friend who we were both in at Park Avenue Baptist Church years ago when Peter Lord was a pastor. And Peter Lord would sometimes just say really funny things and off the wall things. And this guy told me something that I'd never heard him say. He said, here's the thing. When you are washing someone's feet, when you are washing somebody's feet, you're in the perfect position for them to kick you in the face. And the truth is, when you're helping somebody, if you're going out of your way to help somebody, guess what? You might get hurt. In Colossians, it says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach, admonish one another with wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. I hope you'll be able to be genuine and vulnerable, generous and caring and grateful and hopeful. God's word lives in you if you're a believer. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to surrender your life to Christ. I never have to convince anybody that they're sinners. People, people usually tell me I'm an expert at it. But the truth is we all need Christ. And Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So if you want to surrender your life to him today, I'd love to talk to you after the service. We can pray together. It's not a prayer that saves you. It's an attitude of your heart where you say, I surrender all. Jesus, I surrender my life to you and I follow you. I repent from where I've been going and I surrender to you. If you want to do that today, I'd love to talk to you after the service. You can do that before you leave. Maybe you're here today. You've been a Christian a long time, but the truth is lately you've been focused on the wrong things. Hey, we all do that. I do it all the time. And it's a matter of going back to God and going, God, you know what? Without your help, that's what I do. So give me your spirit, your strength. So maybe do that today. We're going to close in prayer and then have our time of giving. Would you join me as we pray? Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word, your power, your strength, your love for us. Lord, in a world that's full of bitter, angry people, may we learn to be full of your love. Lord, protect us from those and make us aware of those who try to hurt us. Lord, help us to put up the right boundaries to not open our hearts just to anyone. But Lord, I pray that that would not keep us from opening our hearts to the right people. Give us those opportunities to be generous and share with others. Bless each one here with your presence this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.